The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christie's.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the latest annual art market report is published in the midst of panic in the banks. So how might the art world be affected? Plus, a big hip-hop show in Baltimore and Juan de Pareja, the artist enslaved by Velasquez. I talked to Melanie Gerlis about the recent turbulence in the banking sector as US banks go under, an ailing credit Suisse is acquired by UBS and Deutsche Bank shares fall by 14%. What are the implications for the art world? Melanie and I also discussed the figures in the latest Art Basel and UBS Global Art Market report. The Baltimore Museum of Art in the US this week opens the exhibition The Culture, Hip-Hop and Contemporary Art in the 21st Century. I speak to Asma Naeem, the director of the BMA and curator of the show, about what she's called the second pop art movement. And this episode's work of the week is The Calling of St. Matthew by the 17th century Afro-Hispanic artist Juan de Pareja. He's best known as the subject of one of the greatest ever portraits by Diego Velázquez, the artist who enslaved Pareja before his manumission in Rome in 1650. David Pullins and Vanessa K. Valdez, the curators of a new exhibition about Juan de Pareja at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, tell me about the painting. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the art newspaper by visiting our website and clicking the subscribe link at the top left of the homepage. You can choose from digital, complete or student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and to our sister podcast, A Brush With, and leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, panic recently ensued in the banking sector after the collapse of two US banks and a takeover of Credit Suisse by UBS, forced by the Swiss government, prompting steep declines in banking shares in Europe, with those in the German giant Deutsche Bank falling by 14% at one point on the 24th of March. All of the banks I just mentioned are sponsors of art events, from fairs to exhibitions. So what effect might this latest banking turbulence have in the art world? I spoke to Melanie Gerlis, an art market columnist for the Financial Times and the art newspaper, about that and the latest figures in one of UBS's landmark partnerships, the Art Basel and UBS Global Art Market Report, which was published on Tuesday. Melanie, before we come to talk about banks, let's talk about the serendipitous publication of the UBS and Art Basel Art Market Report, which has come out uh, this week. As always, there are so many things that one can draw from it, but what would you say are the kind of top line headlines, if you like? I mean, I think the top line really is that the art market as a whole grew last year, but not by as much as maybe we all thought, having seen the kind of bumper Paul Allen type, you know, multi-billion sales. It still grew. I think that's great having grown post-pandemic, but 2021, the market grew by 31% and last year it grew by 3%. So that is, that's a fairly sharp slowdown, I would say. And I guess that, you know, the reasons are those we've probably talked about lots and lots and lots of times, which is we have a very top heavy market. And at the moment, the top end, as in 10 million plus, which is pretty high, is keeping the motor going. It just doesn't feel terribly sustainable or comfortable. Exactly. And so just to drill down into that a bit more, it's really notable that basically in every sector of the art market, the kind of headline top figures, you know, the Paul Allen sale, like you talked about, the big sales through the galleries and so on, are not keeping the market afloat as such, but they're what's driving any growth at all, basically. Yes, exactly. I mean, because she divides the report, doesn't she, in auctions and dealers. And in the auction sector, it was only the 10 million plus level that gained. And for dealers, it was only those with a turnover of 10 million, you know, that did staggeringly well. So yeah, it's exactly that. And in terms of the markets, UK is back up into second, but that's only really because of China and COVID, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, quite a lot of the slower growth was because China, you know, had these strict policies of COVID. So we forget last year that that while those of us thought we were motoring ahead, um, China, particularly in the second half of the year, shut down some fairs, auctions that didn't happen. So yes, you know, China's loss is the UK's gain. What was interesting I thought about the UK was actually at public auction, the UK is still in third place, but it's our dealer 
community that seems to have boosted that number. If we want to take a silver lining, we've got some strong dealers in the UK. And the interesting thing, of course, about the UK is for years we've been talking about the UK versus France. It's still probably too early for Brexit's full effects to be detected. But still, I think it's probably holding up more than some people thought it would have done in 2016, then when Britain actually left the EU and so on. It is. The strength of the dollar hit the euro more than, not to get too technical, but more than it did the pound because it was put longer through the year. So that didn't help France. But yes, the UK is distinctly one of the top three markets. And actually France is facing its own regulatory issues at the moment. So let's see. And finally, very little surprise that the biggest fall in terms of the art market last year was in NFTs. Tell us about that. Yes. I've just written a sort of long report on it for the Financial Times and I didn't even mention NFTs. I think there is a sense in the report that digital art and blockchain you know, haven't gone away. They are there in some form, but certainly we're not talking about them as much. So banks then, this latest series of events, would you describe it as a banking crisis or are we just witnessing a wobble, do you think? I think at the moment it's a wobble that we have to keep all our fingers crossed doesn't turn into a crisis. There are definitely echoes of 2008 and 2009, which make us all feel pretty uncomfortable. But at the moment it's relatively contained. And I think it sort of depends where you sit. So, well, I think if you're in San Francisco, it's probably a lot more frightening than in London. Right. Which is why, in a way, when the mini contagion seemed to spread to Credit Suisse, that was really when we in Europe were like, oh my goodness. And it's just a question of, yes, how contained it can be. Obviously, banks are involved in the art world, but to what extent are they involved in the art world and in what ways? Well, in a fairly major way, they've become the kind of de facto sector for sponsorship, partly because we don't want oil companies anymore, and partly because, you know, in the scheme of things, what a bank gives can give to a museum or an art fair compared to the amount that they generate is fairly small. And it's always helped the banks, I think, because banking, let's face it, is not a very exciting looking industry um, and if they can channel uh, you know their money into art it makes them all a bit more glamorous right yeah now credit suisse are, are one of the companies that they've actually been taken over by ubs a forced takeover yeah. they have been very major sponsors in switzerland particularly but in terms of internationally their major sponsorship is at the national gallery in london in a way that's kind of the headline yeah. sponsorship for the company worldwide i'd say Yes, and I mean, I suspect in the scheme of things, this is pretty low in their list of things to sort out. But it's nerve-wracking times. You know, I don't think banks sign up forever. Who knows? Who knows even if the brand, you know, you could argue it's a tainted brand now. Who knows if that will survive and where an institution like the National Gallery fits in? You know, we don't know. You would hope, as I said, it's a small enough amount And it's in the interest of whatever the bank may or may not be called to keep it going. But sometimes when times are tough, if you're looking for an excuse to pull the plug, they do have an excuse to pull the plug. Right. And UBS is a major art sponsor in its own sense. It's got a major collection and all those kind of things. So in a way, if Credit Suisse was going to be taken over by another bank, this from the art world's point of view is probably as good a company to have taken it over as any. Yes, that's a really good point. I think, yeah, you you couldn't wish for a a better brand, really. I I think, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but I would not be surprised if UBS was the biggest art world banking sponsor that there is. So, yes, you know, we know them. I know them because of their massive sponsorship of Art Basel. But we've just talked about the report. They do things all year round. So hopefully the addition of the National Gallery helps maintain that. And expands the portfolio. Exactly. In terms of takeovers and acquisitions and so on as you say it's such a small element ultimately of a bank's output do these sort of things get reviewed when takeovers happen as in there are certain policies around for instance social responsibility and sponsorship that are very much different from bank to bank aren't they Yes, you know, often these things are at the whim of one person who sat one day in Switzerland and thought, oh, I quite like art. Um, <laughs> so you're slightly, it's all quite fragile in a way. But yes, equally, CSR, corporate social responsibility and diversity, and these things are all really, really important 
for a bank to have. And hopefully they just sit and think, well, we've got something that fits the bill, so we'll just carry on. But it will definitely get looked at. Yeah, everything will. I mean, just to give you a flavour of that, that, about how much it's based upon individuals. Mm -hmm. When I was working at the Tate many, many years ago, there was a bank that sponsored Tate exhibitions and they were very happy. And then a new person got appointed to the corporate team. And the first thing they said was, why can't we have the logo on every label all the way around the show. Um, it was just a completely different sensibility. And that's the thing is, what are banks in the art world for? Is it about attracting clients to events or is it about, you know, their name being associated with a major artist's name and the logo being very prominent? That's the way that it gets very tough for institutions and organisations to, um, to manage sponsorships, right? Yes, I, I agree. And I think, well, what we is a slight aside, but I think then the next corporate sponsor that seems to be coming into our world of the luxury goods brands and there you're getting quite a lot of conflicts I think of interest yeah now there was some big news around Deutsche Bank last week particularly and it was looking very dicey for Deutsche Bank at the, that seems to have gone a bit quieter now but obviously Deutsche Bank are a major sponsor of Freeze huh. what I wanted to know is Obviously, we don't know the exact figures of how much Deutsche Bank gives freeze and so on. But is it more than about cash sponsorship in terms of banks and art fairs? You know, do art fairs to a certain extent rely on the clients that might be brought by banks as well? Because obviously they're working with high net worth individuals that are the lifeblood, as we've heard about, of the market at the moment. Yes, I think one advantage of banking clients is you get their staff who hopefully make a lot of money. I do think the bottom line is money. You know, art fairs, I think the last time I took a look, they make about a third of their revenues from, you know, the galleries who pay to exhibit. They make about a third from ticket sales. And then that other third, and that's at least, it comes from sponsorship. We talk about the big fairs like our Basel and Freeze, but there are, you know, smaller fairs that are sometimes every year having to scrabble for their next sponsor. And it's hard, hard, hard work. So a commitment, I think, to have a multi-year sponsor such as Deutsche Bank for Freeze. And don't forget, they've kept with Freeze. For, you know, Freeze was just in London when they sponsored it. And now they're, you know, they've got Seoul, they've got Los Angeles, mm. and, and Deutsche Bank have a, you know, have a VIP room at all these fairs. Before we talked, I suddenly remembered that Lehman Brothers was the first sponsor of Art HK. And of course, the second, the next year it appeared, there was no Lehman Brothers. The major fairs have a way of finding backers. But we may not be in an environment where that's as easy anymore. In terms of the sort of cause of the banking crisis then, mm. it seems to me that this is, in a way, the kind of wider issue here. High interest rates are bad for the art market generally, right? Yeah, I think it is hard not to see them as bad news. I mean, again, we talked about Claire McAndrews' report. You've got on one level, and then don't forget we talked about Credit Suisse, you know, people are losing jobs. And one reason why banks sponsor our world events is that their employees rather like it and could spend money on art. We're losing people. You know, in the same way the art market has benefited when people were printing money, after the, the previous crisis, the art market benefit because there's a lot of cash in the system. And of course, when interest rates are super high, there's a lot less cash in the system. Never mind all these other activities that banks are doing and the lending and, you know, that rely on interest rates. And, you know, I think, you know, our lending is a, you know, lending money against art, which is already a slightly fragile area of the market, you know, if your interest rates are suddenly super high and then your assets, they don't gain in value. Technically, no, it's not very good news for the art market. Melanie, thanks as ever. Thank you, Ben. Lovely to talk. You can read articles on the banks and the art world and the Art Basel and UBS report online at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. Coming up, hip-hop and contemporary art and a painting by Juan de Pareja. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. The Seattle Art Museum has instantly become home to one of the world's foremost collections of works by the American modernist sculptor Alexander Calder after receiving a gift from the former Microsoft president John Shirley and his wife Kim. The museum's previous Calder holdings numbered 13 pieces, consisting almost entirely of works on paper. The 48 items given by the Shirleys include more than three dozen sculptures, ranging from tabletop stables to monumental hanging mobiles and encompassing most of Calder's career, spanning 1927 to 1973. In addition, 
to the works, the Shirleys are giving the museum their 85 book called a library, a $10 million endowment, and between $250,000 and $500,000 annually to support programming and research relating to Calder. In the Pay Gap reports for 2022 published by Art World organisations, the auction house Bonhams revealed that while women are still paid less than men at the company, that figure is narrowing. Women at Bonhams are now paid 92p for every £1 that men earn when comparing median hourly pay. In 2021, Bonhams paid women just 66p for every £1 a man earns, so it's a 39% rise. This is the closest to parity any major auction house has come since the UK government began to compel companies with more than 250 employees to submit salary data five years ago. At Christie's, the figure is 74p for every £1, and at Sotheby's, 73p for every £1. Could a virtually unknown Vermeer painting be languishing in the storeroom of the Philadelphia Museum of Art? Ari Vallert, a former Rijksmuseum scientific specialist, told a symposium in Amsterdam that he's convinced that there are two versions of the guitar player, a long accepted Vermeer painting at Kenwood House in London with a similar composition to the painting in the Philadelphia Museum. The Philadelphia painting was once assumed to be the original, but was downgraded to a copy when the Kenwood version, which is in superior condition, emerged in 1927. Vallert, who examined Philadelphia's picture and analysed paint samples, believes it's not only a 17th century work, but is actually a painting by Vermeer. He identified traces of ultramarine, an expensive pigment used by the master, as well as lead tin yellow, which went out of use in around 1700. He describes the pigments he found as combinations that nobody else used at the time. You can read all these stories and much more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This April, Christie's presents 20th, 21st century Amsterdam, an exciting online auction bringing together leading international artists working in the past 120 years. Bidding opens from the 11th to the 25th of April, offering excellent examples by the Cobra Group, Group Zero, the German Enfant Terrible and many more. Works are on view during the bidding period until the 24th of April in their Amsterdam galleries with free entry to all. Discover more at christie's.com. Welcome back. Now, the Baltimore Museum of Art on Wednesday opened an exhibition entitled The Culture, Hip-Hop and Contemporary Art in the 21st Century. It coincides with the 50th anniversary of the birth of hip-hop, which is expanded from a movement born out of the experiences of black and Latinx youth in the Bronx in New York in the 1970s to what Todd Boyd, the professor at the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts, better known as Notorious PhD, has called the most significant cultural achievement of the last 30 or 40 years. The show was co-organised by the St. Louis Art Museum, where it travels in August, and the BMA, whose director, Asma Naim, joined me to discuss it. Asma, in the catalogue for this show, you make a very intriguing claim in your essay, which is that this is a second pop art movement, and I'll quote at you, but far more layered, polyphonic, commodified, sustained, and frankly popular than the 1960s one. So tell us more about that. Absolutely. So the ways in which hip-hop and contemporary art have been colliding is understood on a certain level that many of us are familiar with. There's the story of Jean-Michel Basquiat and the ways in which he merged into the downtown punk rock scene, had some brief cameos and Debbie Harry videos, and obviously created a style of um, post-expressionism that had incredible ramifications Uh, for how we think of mark making um, in the post-war period. But what I found absolutely fascinating was the ways in which many of the key originators of the graffiti movement in hip hop were actually well versed in art historical traditions. You have folks like Fab Five Freddy who were going to the Met on a regular basis and had familiarized themselves not only with the with the antiquities traditions in visual expression, but also in terms of more contemporary and I would say modern traditions like pop art. And you see Fab Five Freddy specifically referencing Andy Warhol's Campbell's soup cans on the subway trains during that period. What I am arguing in the essay specifically though, is that what many of us have studied in our art historical textbooks about pop art, about this kind of, you know, merging uh, or a porosity between contemporary art making traditions, 
using or grafting from popular culture in the ways that Andy Warhol, Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns, and and many others, both here and across the pond in the UK, were relying on the everyday vernacular in their depictions. That was mainly a white-centered way of looking at the world. It featured many objects from the grocery stores or a way of living that was speaking to a certain kind of audience. And what I'm arguing here, which, you know, there's many dialogues that are going on about this collision between popular culture and quote unquote high or fine art in other realms of making in the in the fashion world, in graphic arts, and also I would say in material culture. But that conversation about hip hop having this collision between popular culture and high art hasn't really moved into the museum discourse. And I would say if it has, it's only contained itself around the idea of graffiti. And so when I say that we've entered a new pop art movement, what I'm really arguing is that the ways in which hip hop is the most popular cultural movement of our time, the globalism of it, the sheer commodification and financial impact and stakes of it, the ways in which from the youth to the elderly have been capitalizing on the benefits of hip hop, all of that and how visual artists are relying on on that body of work and imagery and conversations and dialogues in the ways that they're creating work is truly a much more polyphonic and complicated and powerful new movement. Absolutely. And of course, one of the ways in which you can argue that is through the just that sheer first image at the top of your essay which is a still from the apeshit video and there you've got Beyonce and Jay-Z in the Louvre and I watched it again in prep for this interview actually and still I was really amazed by how this cultural form which is as you say enormously hugely popular can still actually be shocking in the sense that just seeing those choreographic movements and that performance in the Louvre is an utterly sort of seismic effect, I think. And and I think it's, you know, this idea of moving hip hop into the museum, it can happen in all sorts of ways, of course, but it still is about shaking up a system. And and it seems to me that that video did that. It really did. And and I appreciate you looking at that video again, Ben, because it's, I think, so easily referenced, but not dissected for its incredible impact and complicated um, discussions that it's embroiled in. I would say that the issues of taste and decorum and gatekeeping, those three words are what I immediately think of when I look at that video. And what you have there is this flouting of the conventional taste and the conventional decorum that's largely Eurocentric and white in that video. And you also have an incredible gesture, if you will, to say that, you know, the gatekeepers are no longer able to keep the gates closed. And we have found a way as hip hop moguls to infiltrate culture with a capital C in ways that we want to have reverberate for generations to come. You mentioned about how Basquiat and Fab Five Freddy and so on built, if you like, the language of the Western canon, as it were, but the history of art into the language of hip hop right from the start. And one of the things that really emerges from so much hip hop culture is that deep seated engagement with traditions in the, in that video that we're just talking about that's a very different kind of tradition in many ways but still also Basquiat's use of jazz and Charlie Parker and so on there's a sense in which it's a continuation it's not totally novel form when it emerges in the 70s it's built on a lot of what comes before it and then it continues lots of those associations right the way through Absolutely, Ben. And I think what's important for me as an art historian and a scholar and a curator is to continue to emphasize those incredible late motifs through art history that hip hop in contemporary art is drawing on. And I would also kind of complicate our understanding of hip hop by adding the additional element of the ways in which it's drawing on jazz and the jazz tradition. And what I would say is, you know, that that obviously Basquiat was greatly influenced by jazz and bebop, and there's a lot of references to jazz in modern and contemporary art. But what I'm arguing here, if I may, is that what jazz did for modernism 
is what hip hop is doing for contemporary art, but on a much more saturated and global scale. And that's what we're really looking at in terms of the saturation, in terms of the ways that technology has democratized so much access to these kinds of of expression. One more thing, though, about tradition, I would like to say. What I find absolutely genius about the system of making that hip hop has created is the ways in which it's constantly about disrupting power and subversion. And so what you have with artists who are well-versed in traditional making, like Roberto Lugo, a ceramicist, or Khalil Robert Irving, who's also taking ceramics to an incredibly rebellious form of expression, is that you have these individuals using those traditional methods um, that could be found in such things and makers like Wedgwood, for example, but inverting them and emblazoning, you know, images of Biggie or suggesting the substrate of an actual city street, respectively with Lugo's work and Irving's work. And I find that to be a constant dialogue that I want to have our visitors be aware of and be reminded of as they move through the exhibition. Can the exhibition be a history of hip hop? I mean, it's such a loaded history. It's so complicated, as you referenced earlier on. To what extent can it be a history? Or to what extent can it just allude to certain specific moments? I think that's such a great question, Ben. And I like to use the plural for history for many reasons. And so there's many different histories embedded within hip hop. You know, there's the incredibly magnetic local stories, those who have remained underground and to this day are continuing to practice hip hop, but have not reached that level of global fame. And then, of course, you have the global, you know, moguls who have that kind of international stature. That's one set of histories. Another set of histories is just the ways in which the queer community has been engaged with the origins of hip hop and has continued to be a partner as hip hop kind of weaves through other kinds of genres like techno and club and the ways in which contemporary hip hop slash R&B singers like Beyonce are continuing to draw on the queer community as they um, explore this genre. So when I talk about the history of hip hop, I just wanted to add that proviso that it's multiple histories. And as you suggest, it's completely impossible to, <laughs> to, to present a history of hip hop. And, and that's something that we are trying to gently um, remind visitors that there are so many talented makers and practitioners that we tried our best to include those that we could, but there's obviously omissions. And what we also wanted to do was not provide a sense of comprehensiveness and also a sense of completeness, because as we know, there's so many aspects of those who have been underrepresented in the art world and the ways in which their histories or their archives are just now being revealed, revived, and the ways in which those kinds of stories need to come to the fore is important. So it's not a complete history of hip hop. And I also try to gently suggest to visitors that it's not a show about the history of hip hop. It's a show. It's an exhibition about this beautiful intersection, this kind of collision between hip hop and contemporary art from 2000 to now, that does take a then and now approach. It, of course, introduces visitors to the original social histories and the political histories of the origins of hip hop, but then quickly catapults to the year 2000 to look at making from that point on. One of the things I'm really conscious of is about the ways in which artists have used, if you like, the strategies of hip hop. Like, for instance, when I spoke to Rashid Johnson and I asked him which artist was his first love, if you like, and he didn't choose a visual artist, he chose Rakim from Eric B and Rakim because his attitude inspired him. And this, it seems to me, is an interesting area, like the morality or the the kind of moral position of hip hop, that kind of aggression that Rashid saw or other factors seems to be just as important as, for instance, the forms it takes and so on. I love that example. Thank you very much. And I think, Ben, what we're really talking about here is also just the notion of representation 
who has the gaze and who has the power to hold our gaze. And of course, we're going to alter, you know, that concept when we're talking about musicians. But what I think really is an important aspect of what you're noting in that example between Rashid and Rakim is the ways in which you have an artist seizing the national attention, seizing an audience based on an expression that is personal, that is not conventional, and that actually was inspiring to those who thought that this kind of language wasn't permissible before. And I think that is something that I try to reference when I talk about the idea of canon and the ways in which hip hop has created a canon. And as we know, you know, many people talk about the canon, but we all know that there's more than one canon. And the Western art historical canon continues to dominate how we in the museum world want to structure our exhibition schedule, our acquisitions, our programming. But what we're talking about with hip hop is, and this is what I argue for the entire exhibition and in my essay, is that you now have a canon that is only 50 years young, but has just as much force and influence and impact as Raphael's work or Leonardo's work for many artists practicing today. And so what you have in that Rashid Johnson example is a way in which he is inspired by and perhaps paying tribute to an artist whose excellence and technical proficiency and approach to making has allowed him to be the kind of artist he is today. And then that global sense that you've talked about, this idea of hip hop as a kind of now a absolutely global language and actually a creolized language. It's adapting in different parts of the world and feeding into other nations and so on. How much can you reflect that in the show? Because I know, for instance, in the, there's a brilliant conversation with Todd Boyd in the catalogue in which he talks about going and seeing MC Solar in France and seeing this amazing impact that he's in a department store and he wouldn't have heard that in, in US department stores in that time, that was in the 90s. So this sort of global significance, it seems to me, is, is vital and how are you going to reflect that in the show? I think that th that is an important aspect of the exhibition that we tried to create in certain kind of photography, for example, by Mai Lucas, who was able to be in the Parisian scene and has created portraits of such incredible hip hop stars like MC Solar. We have depictions of rap artists from Mongolia, from Olan Buttar in the exhibition. We have some incredible Brazilian artists and South African artists also in the exhibition, whose conversations with the local hip hop histories influences their way of making. But I wanted to say that you find that global presence, I think, more deeply in our catalog, where we have contributors coming from Scotland by way of India or Muslim feminists who are using hip hop to talk about the ways in which the hijab is actually a way of being empowered. And they're teaching that lesson through hip hop. But I think for us, if we had a few more years and if the pandemic hadn't interrupted our curation, it would have been far more global. But I do think, Ben, this is an interesting question and I so appreciate it because what I want listeners to begin to see are kind of the edges between the museum world, the art market and artists in the world. And there's chasms between those three. And the ways in which, you know, I can go to an art fair in Miami or in Paris at Paris Plu and see certain artists in the galleries that are there at the booths, the ways in which I can see certain artists in museum exhibitions, very different from our research and our outreach to artists who are engaging with the history of hip hop, who haven't achieved that level of representation. And to illustrate this point even further, I would note that this is an exhibition unlike any other for me as a curator in that most of the loans did not come from museums. Most of the loans came from either the artists themselves or collectors who have these works. And what I argue in my essay is that museums are all too ready to have that temporary exhibition about the intersection between hip hop and contemporary art. But have they gone that extra step in actually devoting their long term resources and creating that long tail enterprise of supporting these as acquisitions and adding them to their permanent collections? That is the true question.
Yeah, that's a fascinating point. And also one of the things that this speaks to, I think, is this curious position that hip hop has in culture in the sense that is the most mainstream thing. It's it's probably the most universal language there is, you know, in terms of musical language, uh, cultural language, fashion language, whatever. And yet at the same time, it, it still has that capacity to be sort of countercultural, which seems somehow a, a paradox. But it's a very particular position it holds in society because like I was talking about the video earlier on, it still has the power to shock, it has the power to take the wider culture by surprise. It's truly an interesting paradox, and I would say one of the most, I think, slippery aspects of hip-hop, if you will, and popular culture and contemporary art making. I've had numerous conversations with colleagues who have studied the ways in which musical movements intersect with art making. And when you look at things like jazz or movements like jazz or even movements like punk rock, What you see in those kinds of genres is this constant position of outsider. You know, jazz has not permeated our daily world. Punk rock has not permeated our daily world in the ways that hip hop has. And in some ways, if punk rock did permeate our daily world the ways that hip hop has, many of us would be, you know, standing up in protest that punk rock has lost its essence. How can hip-hop continue to maintain that dual position, if you will, of being authentic and counterculture, but also being so mainstream? I don't have the answer to that. I think that there are some interesting approaches to beginning to understand that kind of duality in thinking through ideas of decorum and taste and the ways in which the youth continue to drive so much of what is understood as hip-hop today. But I think that Also, there is, if I may say it, a sheer moment of celebration for the fact that here are these folks who have been the underdogs, who have been in the shadows, communities, minorities, folks who have not had the hegemony that the white Eurocentric world has had. And when you see them having control and taking the stage, you just want to root for them. One of the things about hip hop that, especially in the wider discussion, is about that there are certain things like its hyper masculinity, which come to the fore every now and again. But I noticed that like in the kind of artists that you're showing and in the catalogue, you're very keen to emphasise how actually those perceptions that some may have of hip hop are really at an extreme end. And it's, it's actually a very inclusive form in many ways. And it seems to me that, that that's summed up by that fantastic Greg Tate quote in which he says hip hop is pumas and a hoodie today but why not leather fringe and sequins tomorrow that seems (laughs) to sum it up (laughs) if we can just take a moment to acknowledge the genius that is Greg Tate he was an incredible thinker an incredible thought partner at the outset of this exhibition and gave me so much support and this entire catalog is dedicated to him and his memory and his work what Greg Tate did for this exhibition was give us that eyewitness account of how hip hop from the very beginning did both. It both excluded women. It both perpetuated certain ideas of misogyny. It was homophobic. But at the same time, there were in those incredibly smoky, dark rooms at the beginning, people who were from the queer community, women. And I think that What's been interesting in terms of the conversations I've had with women executives in the hip hop industry is how they have been a constant presence and almost maternal presence for some of these hip hop stars and the ways in which they have supported and and truly been the, the invisible partner and done the invisible labor. What we wanted to do in thinking through the checklist and thinking about representation and thinking about the content of the artwork that we had was to make sure that we brought forward this contradiction, if you will, of how there could be these different approaches to queerness and to feminisms embedded within this very complicated movement. Asma, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Ben. It's been a true pleasure. The Culture, Hip Hop and Contemporary Art in the 21st Century is at the Baltimore Museum of Art until the 16th of July and then at the St. Louis Art Museum from the 26th of August to the 1st of January 2024.
Now it's time for the work of the week. Until now, Juan de Pareja has been best known as the subject of one of the greatest of Diego Velázquez's portraits, the first painting to sell for more than £1 million at auction when it was acquired in Christie's London sale room for £2.3 million by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1971. Pareja was an Afro-Hispanic man who was enslaved in Velázquez's studio for over two decades. His manumission papers were signed when he was with Velázquez in Rome in 1650, on the same trip that that famous portrait was painted. He then became an artist in his own right and outlived Velázquez by ten years. Before we focus on one of Pareja's own works, here's the artist Judy Meritu talking on our sister podcast A Brush With about that seminal Velázquez painting. Juan de Pereira is such an important painting to me. How dehumanized somebody becomes in being somebody's object, in being somebody's slave, being enslaved to someone else. And yet the deep humanity with which he's painted in the kind of, you know, the kind of profound breath that he's about to take, the expression in his eyes, the touch of his mouth, this awareness of that deep sense of being. And yet the contradiction inherent in that by being the object of one, by being one's enslaved person and being one slave. And to me that there's this, that contradiction and is, is, is part of the contradiction in the history of art. And as it's something that kind of, I'm always amazed by, but also moved by. And, um, it helps me kind of find my place in the world. I think in a way that, that we live in these contradictions constantly, we are constantly inventing within them and trying to, you know, locate ourselves in that space. So, a new exhibition at the Met is the first to tell Pareja's story and examine inextricable links between enslaved artisanal labour and the art of the so-called Golden Age in Spain, in works by Francisco de Zubaran, Bartolomé Esteban Murillo and Velázquez. But the main focus is Pareja himself, who was documented in artistic biographies up to the 19th century, but then largely ignored until the great Harlem Renaissance collector and scholar Arturo Schomburg brought him to new prominence in the 1920s. The exhibition features seven Several of Pareja's paintings, including his largest, The Calling of St. Matthew, painted in 1661 and lent to the Met by the Prado Museum in Madrid. I spoke to the co-curators of the exhibition, David Pullins and Vanessa K. Valdez, about the painting and the artist. David, I'd like to begin with just a brief biographical sketch. Could you just tell us who Juan de Pareja was? So we know that Juan de Pareja is born around 1608 in the city of Antequera, which is in the south of Spain. And he doesn't actually reappear in the records until 1634 uh, with Velasquez. So those years we can only speculate about really at this stage. But from 1634 until 1650, when the manumission papers are signed by Velasquez, he's freed four years later. Uh, that's a period that we can document in large part because of his proximity to Velasquez, who's of course one of the most studied of artists. And then subsequent to that, at the end of his life, the documentation really comes, and I think most excitingly, through the fact that he left a large body, at least a dozen solidly attributed works, and beyond that we're trying to build out, but to really understand him as a record, a legacy, not necessarily in writing yet, although those might emerge from the archives, bits and pieces have, but largely through enormous canvases that really haven't been unpacked as documents at the end of his life, as art historical documents. Tell us about the art historical record, if you like, about Juan de Pareja, because, of course, in the 20th century, he's almost undocumented, it seems. But but before that, there were examples. Palomino, the great biographer of Spanish artists, for instance, wrote about him, and as did others all the way through to the 19th century, right? The thing about it really is that in many ways, I often say that Juan de Preja's name was probably better known in the 19th century than it is today. And essentially, it was sort of lost by the early 20th century. Of course, his name was known for in his own lifetime. But beyond that, its association with the Mets painting, the sitter was never in question. He was always known. The fact that it kind of pittered out by the early 20th century as an art historical story and became more of a historical curiosity around his status as an enslaved individual is one of the problems we were facing. And one of the really pivotal things for me was the discovery in the crisis, the end of LACP's periodical during the Harlem Renaissance, Arthur Schomburg, thinking about not simply the fact that he existed, that was known, this and that about his biography, more or less true, bits of information about his biography circulating, but Schomburg recognized the political importance of the recovery work around Pareja for the present. And that had this amazing kind of resonance, obviously, for us in the early 21st century, to think 100 years before someone not only saw 
the figure of Pareja in the past, but saw him for what he might mean for the present. And that's really how I came to first speak to Vanessa, who had written a biography of Schomburg. Tell us, Vanessa, what Schoenberg said when he saw this painting that we're going to talk about, because it, it's lovely that we actually have his documented reaction to the painting, isn't it? So Arturo Schoenberg sold his private collection to the Carnegie Corporation for the explicit purpose of donation to the New York Public Library. And with those earnings, he travels to Europe with the explicit purpose of recovering all evidences, what he called vindicating evidences, of communities of African descent in his parlance, Negro communities, and how they contributed to their societies. And so his first stop was in Spain. He was someone that in his time, while people were writing about African-American history in the United States, less so about the Caribbean, he was really focused on Spanish roots of enslavement and how that started prior to British colonization in the United States. And so he was the lone voice. Even his contemporaries said that he was always focusing on an expansive definition of blackness to include Spanish-speaking populations in addition to English and French in the Americas. And so when he goes to Spain, he goes to Granada to look for work by Juan Latino. Juan Latino was a professor of classics who was born into enslavement, 16th century Spain. We have that book in the exhibition. And he also writes about later when he goes to Madrid, to see the work of Juan de Pareja, hence the article that David was alluding to, In Quest of Juan de Pareja, where he wants to see in particular the calling of St. Matthew. And so he writes about the painting at the time was not on exhibition in the Prado. And so he speaks to the director, convinces the director that he has traveled thousands of miles to see Juan de Pareja or to see this work. And he gains access to it. And he writes about being in reverent silence in the face of this large canvas. And it really is a large canvas, David, isn't it? It's extraordinarily large. Yeah, it's about 11 feet wide. And that's something that a lot of people sort of ask, well, how do we know he was successful? How do we know he was this ambitious painter at the last decade of his life? And it's true, we're just starting to piece together any evidence of patronage, let alone reception. It's hard in the 17th century reception history for a painter. But when you look at something at that scale and that complexity, it's pretty obvious that you don't do that on spec. You don't do that for fun on the weekends. You do it because you have patrons who are willing to back it. And both that and a similarly scaled work also from the Prado, the Baptism of Christ, attest to a degree of success that we wouldn't otherwise on the kind of archival side know about. And Vanessa, there's this intriguing idea that it might be a kind of allegory or, or a kind of metaphor for Juan de Pareja's own situation, this painting, in the sense that it's about a religious conversion. I mean, it's it's interesting because when people compare the Velazquez portrait to his own self-portrait, which is featured in The Calling of St. Matthew, Juan de Pareja is very aware of visual cues that signify Catholicism, that signify being a faithful man in the Catholic faith specifically. And so, you know, there are allusions to that. It's The Calling of St. Matthew. <laughs> you have Jesus, you have a few apostles in there. Um, and so the fact that he inserts himself in that scene is quite significant. And David, there's this wonderful thing that he is looking at us, Juan de Pareja, but looking at him is another figure who we think is another painter. And, and that seems really significant in the sense it is a tribute to the esteem with which he is held as a painter in his own time, it seems to me. I think so, absolutely. It was one of the moments that I found very exciting in doing some of the research on that painting was trying to build a stronger case for that second figure also being a portrait. Most of the other figures seem to be types or maybe they're based on models, but there's a second portrait really someone looking at him and it's pretty convincing i think that the comparative suggests that it's jose antolines who would have been his contemporary his much younger contemporary because of course his entire career is much belated due to having been enslaved in velasquez's studio but you know the wonderful thing about juan de Pareja's story as an artist is the way that once he is painting on his own he abandons velasquez's style totally and instead just jumps full on into what was then contemporary cutting edge painting. And it looked very different than what he'd been around for the last 25 years in Velasquez's studio. It's flashy and bright and baroque over the top dense compositions. And Antolinas is part of that world. So what I love about the inclusion of presumably it's something like a friendship portrait to include him in that group scene is it attests to a new network of people, a new patronage network, artistic colleagues with whom he's discussing and developing his art. David, is there any significance in him 
doing a picture of a conversion in relation to the fact that he may be of Morisco heritage. So-called Morisco people were Muslims who were forced to convert to Catholicism after the reconquest done by the Catholic monarchs in 1492. I think, you know, absolutely that both the way that he's depicted there in this moment of potential conversion, also, as I mentioned, that baptism of Christ image is one of which he signs his name wonderfully and Trump lay carving on a rock. It's the most adamant claim to artistic authority. And that rock is crushing a serpent. So he's saying, not only did I make this, look at what I've achieved, but I'm also extremely Catholic and extremely religious. You know, in many ways, there are a few things to be said. One is, you know, he's born in Spain. People ask all the time. Did he speak Spanish? Was he Christian? He was fluent in Spanish. He probably picked up some Italian while he was in Italy. But, you know, that's his native language. And he also presumably was either Christian or forced to be Christian. In terms of whether he was Morisco, which has traditionally been often assumed, you know, when you go back to the archival record, there's actually no documentation. So in the in the context of the exhibition, we really try to keep that question open about Spain being a multicultural, multiracial society, far more than people often recognize. And... The early documents around him, first of all, in his own lifetime, there's absolutely no writing about the color of his skin or his ethnic origins, racial uh, background at all. The first mention at all is in Palomino, which, uh, he, you know, he's as close as you can get, but he's in the 1720s. He mentions that uh, Wanda Preja is of a strange color that you can interpret however you like and of mixed heritage. Both things are slightly useless for saying he's either Morisco or of sub-Saharan African origin. When you look at the writing out of that sub-Saharan African population in Spain has been pretty consistent in the way that Spanish history for the 17th century is talked about. It's often seen as though maybe Seville is a way en route through Lisbon to the Americas, but in actuality, there are all kinds of people who are, of course, a heavy North African population. The tendency has, on the whole, been to focus on a Morisco population because that's, in fact, unavoidable in southern Spain if you look at the Islamic art and architecture that remains there. But the reality is in the 17th century, large sub-Saharan populations of of enslaved people, not only are they en route to the Americas, which was overwhelmingly the case via Seville and Lisbon, but also large numbers remain there enslaved. And that population on the whole has gotten less recognition for a kind of lived long-term presence in southern Spain that I think we wanted to make sure was a distinct possibility for Juan de Preja's own heritage. We are very well aware of not only a legacy of assigning this identity to Juan de Padeja, I think it is a point of conversation because what I have found, you know, I am a scholar of Afro-Latin American studies and Afro-Latinx studies. And for some people, it is difficult to wrap their heads around Blackness and Latinidad and Spanish-speaking legacy. In general, even to this day, I've written about it with Arturo Schomburg. We continue to see it, at least here in the United States as well. And part of that is an erasure of histories of peoples who have lived for hundreds of years. And so, you know, we recognize that there is some kind of comfort in saying, oh, well, Juan de Padeja was Morisco, but it also signifies a discomfort and an anxiety around populations of African heritage, be it North African, be it Sub-Saharan, but of African heritage that were born in Spain and that lived in Spain several hundred years ago. It seems to me hugely significant that there is a figure in the back of this picture who may well be an enslaved person. Vanessa, is that your perception? What do you make of that character? Because interestingly, the halo of St. Matthew covers the face of this figure. There's a whole conversation with that painting that I don't think has yet been taken up in art history, and not only in the recognition of the inclusion of the figure, but in fact, we have a sculpture early on in the exhibition that speaks to the complexity of enslavement in that moment, right? And so you see Mercedarian friars buying back kidnapped Catholics from a Turkish, presumably Muslim merchant who has enslaved a sub-Saharan assistant. So you see all of that and it is signified by skin tone. It's signified by phenotype. And that is a kind of complex figure that certainly here in the United States, due to the legacy of the one drop rule, whereby any kind of African heritage signifies something. There's a difficulty in understanding that that conflation of African heritage with slavery has not yet happened, right? And so I think that the calling of St. Matthew also reveals that kind of complexity, right? Because you see someone who in the, in the background is perhaps a page, 
may be enslaved. We know that this is the moment when darker skin in paintings is starting to signify that. Yeah, I think there's a lot more going on than we have accounted for. It is hard not to understand that other figure as perhaps a distinction for Pereja himself. If you see that painting as kind of an assimilationist self-representation, he does distinguish himself, in a sense, in skin tone from that figure in the background, who also was wearing a kind of page's collar that is sort of through an ornamental mode demeaning, uh, you know, makes him a secondary servant figure that's distinct from how Pereja represents himself. Obviously, this painting is made in 1661. Velasquez had died the year before. You say he's emerging from the shadows, which is a very neat term for the darkness of Velasquez's paintings. But also, it seems to me very manifesto-like, this painting, in terms of, look what I can do. There's so much detail in the interior and the objects that he's saying, I can paint this, I can paint that, and so on. <laughs> David? I think absolutely. I mean, it, the thing for me that sums that up the most is the carpet, which occupies a huge amount of the foreground, but is also just this wonderful exploration of what he can do with paint also the still life essentially of course it's wonderful it's the tax collectors and they apparently are organizing their money according to not just coins but jewelry and little bags and this kind of thing Pareja really relishes the opportunity to do still life but also different kinds of facial types you know also by including the self-portrait he also is holding a piece of paper a you know typical artistic device but he's holding a piece of paper with his name on it with the date of the painting declaring what he's achieved and it has this kind of effect of announcing his place in the world. The other thing I would say on that is, and you know, one of the attempts in all of this has been to gather the works that can be attributed to him, those that might have been lost. And one of those is an unbelievably tempting thing in the auction records in the 19th century of a, an oil on copper by Juan de Preja. And often reductions of larger paintings on copper were you know, made as kind of jewel-like, wonderful collector's objects. And it's meant to be after that painting. So it suggests that even in his own time, there was a desire to document it, let it circulate, and understand its point at a pivotal moment in Pereja's career. Vanessa, I wanted to end by going back to Arturo Schoenberg, because one of the things that he says in that quote, as you say, is, is that he wants to tell my people in America of this further claim back in the 17th century to a place in the Republic of Arts and Letters. In a way, that work's still going on, isn't it? And that's what you're doing with this show. It is absolutely still going on. I mean, in recent years, the publication of this series of articles on 1619 and then the book and now the documentary series has really foregrounded the contribution of Black history, right, of Black peoples to the United States, to U.S. history. That is something that Arturo Schomburg and his network of colleagues, of librarians, of archivists, of historians, that was the work that they were involved in, you know, again, a century ago. And a century ago, we're looking at 60 years after Reconstruction and the end of the Civil War. And so, you know, there's a constant need to revive a history, right? And to say, when we are thinking about a whole people and the contributors to a nation, looking and acknowledging and recognizing the contributions of everyone in that space. And so I am so very honored and pleased to have been invited to bring Abdul Schomburg into this, again, to say, not just, you know, in this 2023 moment, that we are asking these questions. But in fact, again, a century ago, someone else in New York City, prior to the arrival of Velasquez's portrait, was also asking these questions. Well, David and Vanessa, thank you both very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Juan de Pareja, Afro-Hispanic painter, is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York until the 16th of July. And that's it for this episode. You can find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Judy Mahalska and David Clack. And David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Melanie, Asma, David and Vanessa. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.